the image in the New England Journal shows this person's palm. And it concerns a 73-year-old woman who presents with a history of itching and painful lesions on the palms of her hands. And we're supposed to say what this is. And if we look at these palms, uh, they have a strange pattern, which reminds one of the inside of an animal's, or a human for that matter, stomach. So this is not palmar psoriasis. Uh, this is not acromegaly. This is not palmoplantar keratoderma. This is not a fungus infection. In English, this is called tripe palms because uh, if you go to the butcher and order stomach to take home for eating, it's called tripe. Uh, in German, the term is something else, but the German term for this condition would be called acanthosis palmaris. But it looks like the inside of a stomach so we'll have a look at that. And indeed, that's the correct answer. And this person has gastric carcinoma. So this is a cutaneous sign of a systemic malignant disease. Now, stomach has a great tradition. And in Germany, uh, the favorite dish of Chancellor, Chancellor Kohl was stomach, Zaumag, or pork stomach. And in case you're interested, I gave you a recipe that you can look up. Uh, in Scotland, stomach is also a specialty, usually sheep's stomach, and that dish is called haggis. So uh, I went to medical school in South Philadelphia, where you could buy stomach or tripe uh, at the neighborhood butcher shop. And uh, there are German terms for this, and there's also a German dish for tripe, which is quite tasty. Uh, but the topic today is paraneoplastic dermatoses, such as acanthosis nigricans, the sign of lesser trallet, tripe palm, acquired ichthyosis, and palmar plantar keratoderma. So you can read about these items. Uh, but they, these are typical questions that we ask medical students, and you see them several times in your career. Here are the examples. Acanthosis nigricans. Uh, also associated with severe obesity, but this can indicate uh, the presence of a systemic malignant disease. Uh, these, this is the sign of blizzard trellet. Um, these are seborrheic uh, changes in the skin, and to have two or three or five of these is no big deal, but if you suddenly sprout this many, you may have an underlying malignancies, malignancy. Here's acquired ichthyosis. Here's another example of a tripe palm. This is palmoplantar keratoderma. This is Bazak syndrome. And uh, this patient here has sweet syndrome, which is associated with various things, but also systemic malignancies. And skin biopsy will show a neutrophilic dermatosis. First topic at the New England Journal is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, first actually described in boxers. Uh, now there's major concern about American football players, uh, but this condition can develop in any person that is subjected to um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, and um, the topic here, today concerns neurodegenerative disease mortality, not in American football players, but rather in soccer players. And that's also a fairly rough sport. Uh, so this study concerns 7,000 former professional soccer players from Scotland. And uh, now this is a case control study. So we have 7,000 soccer players, how to match them for control persons. So these patients were matched on the basis of social deprivation. Now, professional soccer players are not socially deprived because they generally make enough money. But the control group here, consisting of 23,000 individuals, uh, was matched in terms of um, income and social standing, etc., uh, to deal with that problem. 
So that's where the term social deprivation comes from. I don't think either the soccer players or the match controls were socially deprived. At any rate, there are three times more controls than there are soccer players. And what we see here is the soccer players actually live longer. And below age 70, they do quite a bit better than the socially deprived mass controls. But after age 70, they do substantially worse. And the reason, as we're going to find out, has to do with um, neurodegenerative disease. Because in terms of all-cause mortality, the soccer players actually do a little bit better. Uh, they have less ischemic heart disease, probably because of cardiovascular fitness. They have substantially less lung cancer because they probably don't smoke. Uh, but after age 70, they have more neurodegenerative disease. And um, if we look at that, I've outlined here the percent in each group. So 3% of the soccer players, I don't think that's very many, but uh, develop any neurodegenerative disease compared to only 1% of the controls. And Alzheimer's disease is uh, identified and motor neuron disease and Parkinson's disease so these problems occur a little more commonly in the soccer players than in the controls, but it's not exactly epidemic proportions. Uh, so if we look at um, uh, the influence of player position, we also get some pretty interesting information because you're better off if you're a goaltender compared to being an outfield uh, player or a striker or a defenseman, et cetera. Uh, and apparently the goaltenders uh, aren't roughed up as much as the other soccer players. So that's it for the soccer players. The next topic in the New England Journal is cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis, as we've known for 30 years, is an autosomal recessive genetic disease that involves mutations in uh, the CFT, CFTR, the cystic fibrosis um, um, uh, regulatory protein, which is actually a chloride channel, fairly complicated channel with uh, 12 trans uh, uh, sp membrane spanning domains. And the mutation that was first described is uh, the delta 508 mutation, which is a three base pair deletion uh, resulting in a phenylalanine that's not expressed in the protein. Now, there have been many, many mutations described in CFTR, uh, but 70% of the mutations in Germany and also Austria and Switzerland involve this Delta 508 mutation. But there are other possible mutations and a number of patients are also gonna be compound heterozygous where they have a Delta 508 uh, mutation in one allele and one of these other mutations in the other CFTR allele resulting in illness. That for the background. Now the problems in CFTR mutations can involve transcription, translation. They can also involve protein folding. Uh, then they can involve, even if there's less CFTR expressed in the membrane, the expressed CFTR doesn't work very well. Uh, functionality problems. So these uh, problems are uh, subdivided in certain classes of illness uh, that allows the physicians to determine exactly where the underlying problem lies. Now, in the last few years, medications have been developed to deal with the folding problem and to also deal with the decreased functional problem. So the folding problem would, result, uh, would require a medication that corrects the folding defect so that more protein is expressed in the membrane. And the potentiator medication would um, adjust the protein so that the chloride channel function uh, is more ideally expressed. So that's the idea. So if we look at the medications that have been de developed for this, uh, I've listed several here, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this medication here is a um, corrector. It, in, it addresses the folding problem, and these other two CAFTOR medications 
restore the function of the protein. And in the studies that we're going to look at, the best is a triple combination of all three. And uh, these medications are given uh, orally uh, once a day in the morning or evening. And these are fairly complicated medications, as you can see here. Um, but they've been developed for the treatment of cystic fibrosis. We've looked at earlier studies involving a dual therapy in persons with certain mutations, but in this particular study that we'll examine now, the Delta 508 mutation that's by far the most common uh, is addressed with a triple therapy of these CAFTOR medications to restore uh, folding and also restore to potentiate the channel so that it works better. And the patients that were enrolled here have at least one Delta 508 allele. Uh, so, um, and some presumably were uh, homozygous for having two Delta 508 alleles. So these patients were selected for that problem. Uh, as, as we look at these patients in this randomized controlled trial, um, <clears throat> there are no gender differences uh, these patients were selected, uh, these are young adults, and uh, uh, when I first encountered this, encountered this problem, these persons usually died, died in relatively early childhood, so there's been progress made here. Uh, patients were recruited in North America and also Europe and Australia. Uh, they have a reduced uh, FEV1 of about 60%. Uh, these because of their disease, these people are slender, thin, and they have high sweat chloride concentrations. And uh, there are various respiratory domain scores. This one uh, is, a, uh, is a disease severity score uh, outlined here. And uh, at the beginning of the randomization, the patients are similar in both groups. Now, what we see here is that the patients that received the triple CAFTOR therapy did remarkably better uh, than the patients that got placebo. And uh, this answer was seen relatively rapidly in this study that only lasted 24 weeks. But if we look at the percent improvement in FEV1, FEV1 improved remarkably in a, in a two week period and stayed at this level throughout the entire treatment period. If we look at pulmonary exacerbations, infections, uh, treatment for pneumonia, hospitalization, et cetera, these are dramatically induced by the triple CAFTOR therapy. And if we look at these uh, Gaussian distributions in the placebo group compared to the CAFTOR treated group, we can see here that the CAFTOR treated group in terms of absolute change from baseline and FEV1 is markedly shifted to the right. Wasn't dramatic in all the patients for reasons that aren't clear to me, but it was a dramatic separation of the two groups. And sweat chlorides in the CAFTOR treated patients dropped 40%, which is approaches normal. Uh, and uh, their uh, respiratory domain score uh, was also markedly improved by four weeks and stayed at that level for the duration of the study. And here's the distribution of their sweat chlorides markedly reduced in the CAFTOR treated patients compared to the control patients. So this is a dramatic study. Uh, two patients in the CAFTOR group uh, discontinued treatment because of rash. Uh, must have been relatively severe. Some of the patients in the placebo group also developed a rash. Uh, there were some changes in liver enzymes in the CAFTOR treated patients, uh, but um, uh, in terms of serious adverse events, they're actually reduced in the CAFTOR treated patients compared to the placebo treated patients that obviously had after adverse events also related to their underlying disease in this relatively short term study. So this looks like a very promising result for the treatment of cystic fibrosis in patients that have the most common uh, mutation, which is the Delta 508 mutation in CFTR. And in the editorial, the editorialist includes this little letter from this cystic fibrosis patient from 30 years ago, uh, 
who says, today is the most best day of my life. They have found the gene for cystic fibrosis. Admittedly, it's taken 30 years to do anything about it, but at last the positive results and the development of these Kaftor medications addressing the folding defect and the functional defect uh, has advanced since 2012 to 2019, where we can expect indeed a game changer for the treatment of, the patient, uh, of, the, of patients with this pretty awful genetic disease. The next topic in the New England Journal is coronary artery disease, particularly left main coronary artery disease. Now we have three coronary arteries. There's a right coronary artery, and uh, there's a circumflex coronary artery and a left anterior descending coronary artery. And they usually uh, arise from a common stem called the left main coronary artery. Now, when there's atherosclerotic disease in this main stem, uh, physicians are somewhat reluctant to stent these lesions because if anything goes wrong, uh, these patients are going to lose blood supply not only to the LCA, but also to the LAD, which would probably result in a fairly abrupt cardiac death. So in earlier times, patients with left main disease uh, were left for surgical repair uh, through bypass surgery rather than treatment with stents. But as stents got better and as um, cardiac catheters, percutaneous interventions got better. Uh, this idea was challenged. And about 10 years ago, a study was designed where patients with left main coronary artery disease were randomized to bypass surgery or percutaneous intervention. And by the time this study was initiated, everolimus eluding stents were available. Uh, so these patients were randomized, about a thousand in each group, to either percutaneous intervention to get their left main disease stented compared to placebo. So this was a randomized prospective trial, and we've already inspected the results at a year, but now we have five-year results in these patients. And what we see here is what we saw earlier. Uh, the operated patients have a little more problems uh, adjacent to their operative intervention, but in the long term seem to fare a little better than the PCI patients. But actually, 22 uh, per, uh, percentage of patients that have death, stroke, or myocardial infarction five years out compared to 19.2 is not statistically significant. And if we look at the actual curves here, what we see is that both groups really do very well. And if we look at death, stroke, myocardial infarction, or ischemia-driven revascularization, there is a significant difference here in favor of the cabbage patients compared to the PCI patients. It's about a 5% difference, but it's not dramatic. But the primary endpoint was not different in the two groups, and we can look at uh, different details here, primary and secondary outcomes over three periods of observation. And uh, there are some subtle differences. Not quite sure what happened here. Uh, these patients were, uh, their geographic region is described as other. Uh, but at any rate, what we see here is that the only really significant differences in the episodes of ischemia-driven revascularization necessary in the PCI patients compared to the cabbage patients. The difference here is 7%. That's statistically significant. That's a secondary event, not the primary hypothesis. So we conclude that both of these therapies work pretty well. And um, there is no significant difference between PCI and cabbage with respect to rates of the composite outcome of death, stroke, or myocardial infarction at five years. The next topic in the New England Journal concerns patients that have an outside of the hospital cardiac arrest who are resuscitated and make it to the hospital. Now, practically by definition, if the patients can be resuscitated enough to make it to the hospital, they must have some sort of shockable rhythm because if they don't have at least that, they probably wouldn't make it to the hospital. Now, if they make it to the hospital, uh, these patients are intubated and go to the intensive care unit and receive 
the current standard of care for this condition. If they have obviously already aspirated, they're treated for aspiration pneumonia. But if this isn't the case, uh, the hypothesis here is that a prophylactic antibiotic therapy for at least two days after admission to the intensive care unit would diminish what we call early ventilator-associated pneumonia after cardiac arrest. Now, prophylactic antibiotics are controversial for a variety of conditions, but that was basically the hypothesis that was tested here. So the clinical outcome is the development of ventilator-associated pneumonia after admission to the coronary care unit. And what we see here is that the antibiotic group had about 40% less early ventilator-associated pneumonia than the control group, uh, which is statistically significant, implying that this prophylactic antibiotic treatment for these patients is warranted. And uh, here we see the mean percentage of days with uh, antibiotic use. It's actually then reduced in the antibiotic group because they got less pneumonia than the control group. And uh, here's an idea of the bacteriology of the pneumonias in these patients and uh, gram-negative pneumonias. Haemophilus influenzae played an important role here and the organism is sensitive, sensitive to these treatments. So this prophylactic antibiotic treatment seems to be a reasonable thing to do in patients with outside of the hospital cardiac arrest that have a shockable rhythm. The review in the New England Journal concerns what we call malignant hypertension. Uh, that is severe hypertension with obvious target organ damage. And what I show you here is a record of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's blood pressures between 1935 to the 12th of April, 1945. And indeed, even in those days, blood pressure could be measured, but there was no treatment for hypertension and doctors didn't know what to do about it. So if we look at FDR's blood pressure at the time of D-Day, he already had a systolic blood pressure of 230, uh, over 130. And uh, then he ran for re-election for his fourth term. Then he went to Yalta and he wasn't in good shape there. And before this event occurred, he had a blood pressure. You can look at this graph. Information was uh, published in the New England Journal in 1995. He had a blood pressure of 320 over 200 millimeters of mercury. Then he had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. And his physician, a rear admiral, Dr. McIntyre says, this came out of the clear sky. No idea that something that like that might happen. Now, when this occurred, there was no treatment for malignant hypertension, with one exception, and that's a treatment that was introduced by Walter Kempner, which was a dietary treatment. And Walter Kempner had published this kind of information, and we can look at the papilledema in this patient going away and an improvement in the chest X-ray. Here's another example of uh, stage four hypertensive retinopathy regressing with this dietary treatment. So if FDR would have been put on this diet, he might have done a little better at Yalta, but of course he had a rear admiral as physician instead of having Walter Kempner as his physician. So the review is on acute severe hypertension. The diet idea has practically disappeared and it's not mentioned in this review at all. But this patient that's described here also had bilateral flame hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, and papilledema, just like Dr. Kempner's patients did. And if we encounter such patients, and this still happens, these patients need to be admitted to the hospital, and if they have this severity of a problem, this degree of target organ damage, they should be admitted to an intensive care unit and have their blood pressure reduced under control conditions. So here are the clear, uh, key clinical points, acute severe hypertension, target organ damage, chronic hypertension, shifting the cerebral blood flow autoregulatory curve to the right, and the medications that we have available now, none of which were available in FDR's time. And um, patients nowadays develop this problem because 
of poor adherence to medications that they've already been prescribed. And all of these issues are discussed in this review. So the precipitating factor is primarily not adherence to prescribed antihypertensive medications. And we're aware of the autoregulatory curve in which um, uh, across a wide range of mean arterial blood pressures, cerebral blood flow stays pretty constant so that we don't get a cerebral hemorrhage when something like this occurs. And in chronic hypertension, this whole relationship is shifted to the right, which is good so that the patients aren't immediately subjected to cerebral hemorrhage, but target organ damage and looking at their fund, uh, looking at doing a fundoscopic examination gives us a pretty good idea what's going on in the brains of these people. So hypertensive encephalopathy, acute cerebral hemorrhage, having like an acute stroke, coronary syndromes, heart failure, aortic dissection, and renal failure. And we can deal with these problems with a variety of medications. And they're all outlined here, broad array of beta blockers and calcium channel antagonists and nitroglycerin and even giving patients nitroprusside. This is an NO strategy, potassium channel openers, all outlined here. And um, <coughs> so this patient with target organ damage needs to go to the intensive care unit, needs to have intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring performed. And I would probably treat this patient with labetalol, but that drug's not available in Germany, not because the drug isn't any good, but because it was not very popular and not physicians didn't prescribe it enough so that it wasn't maintained on the market. Here's the patient from last week with a funny looking toe with this black discoloration. And what we see here is that this is a malignant melanoma. Uh, a wide excision was done here and the patient's done well after 18 months without evidence of recurrence or metastasis. Now, this is a video and this is inside the gastrointestinal tract. And what we, if you look at, click on this video, what you'll see is this very unpleasant looking flat worm uh, that's present in this person's gastrointestinal tract. And this is a liver fluke, fasciola hepatica. And um, uh, this fluke was um, um, extirpated during cholangiopancreatography. Uh, and um, was identified, and then this patient was treated for liver fluke disease. Don't see this much commonly nowadays. This patient had emigrated from Mexico, actually China, Far East is, is where this problem is most prevalent, but uh, currently this uh, disease has not disappeared, but is controlled. Now the patient in the New England Journal bothered me quite a bit because uh, the patient develops a middle lobe pneumonia and middle lobe pneumonia should also be a, always be a warning sign, particularly if they don't go away with fairly prompt antibiotic treatment. So this is here what we see is a normal chest X-ray and we can see uh, uh, both lung fields are clear, bones are also okay, costophrenic angles are okay, Costocardiac angles are okay. We can see the right heart border without difficulty. We see the left heart border without difficulty. But if there's a right middle lobe pneumonia, the right heart border is no longer delineable as it is in the control rentgenogram. And in, with middle lobe pneumonias, there's commonly middle lobe collapse, raises the possibility that maybe there might be a cancer or some other process lymph node enlargement involving uh, the uh, lobar bronchus that goes to the right middle lobe. Now, the patient that we're going to discuss today is a 51-year-old man who comes to his doctor because he has the symptoms of pneumonia. Uh, he's treated with azithromycin and uh, uh, doesn't get any better, and then he gets a second um, macrolide antibiotic and after two weeks he's still not any better and uh, this is a warning sign uh, 
because if we look at his chest x-ray, his right heart border is not clear. And this costo uh, cardiac angle is not clearly delineated compared to the controlled chest x-ray that I showed you earlier. So the patient has fever, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, okay, has some pharyngeal edema. And um, what's done here is this patient receives another course of antibiotics. This would be his third course. And this right middle lobe pneumonia hasn't gotten any better. Now he has a white count of 13,900 and um, hemoglobin is okay. He's got a little left shift. His creatinine level is okay, but no urinalysis is done. That would have probably been a good idea. Uh, this patient is then, the American term for this is lost to follow up. In other words, he didn't follow directions and didn't come to the physician when this didn't get any better. One month later, his wife brings him to the hospital and now he's got a creatinine of uh, 22.6 milligrams per deciliter, and he makes no urine at all. So this is an example of acute kidney injury occurring in a span of four weeks, makes no urine at all. Um, laboratory values are done, serum albumin, acid base balance, all of this is all commensurate with um, a creatinine of 22.6 milligrams per deciliter. So a kidney biopsy is done and he's got an extra capillary, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis with crescent formation as shown here. And there's a differential diagnosis for people that have a pulmonary renal syndrome. This patient has a right middle lobe infiltrate that won't go away with the antibiotic treatment and he's got these glomeruli. So what could he have? So an evaluation is done for the causes of pulmonary renal syndromes. And one of the candidates would be an ankyvasculitis. And he actually has uh, anti-nuclear cytoplasmic antibodies. They're positive. And he's got anti-proteinase 3 antibodies at a high titer. Now, the other thing that's in the differential diagnosis would be anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies. And he has these two. And on immunofluorescence, he shows linear staining. Here's the crescent. Here's linear staining. Now, if he only had ankyvasculitis, we would expect a posse immune glomerulonephritis. But this patient has an uh, basement membrane uh, antibody disease. What's the connection? Well, uh, we know that up to a third of patients that have um, um, anti-GBM antibodies also have ANCA. And this condition is called double antibody positive disease. And we also know that about 5% of patients that have ANCA vasculitis also have anti-GBM antibodies. And the immunofluorescence helps us tease this out because the presentation here is a little atypical. This is a male patient. Uh, he's a little older than the patient, the, the males that we usually see with this disease. Patients with anti-GBM glomerulonephritis generally have diffuse and bilateral disease, which was not the case in this patient. Anti-GBM nephritis has another peak age of onset at a later age where women are primarily involved. But this patient has double antibody glomerulonephritis, and he was stuck on dialysis. Had he had an urinalysis at his first or an early presentation, then maybe he could have possibly been treated with steroids and cyclophosphamide or anti-B cell therapy and not ended up in this dialysis-dependent state. Another comment, in the, a comment in, the, in, the U, in the New England Journal involves the U.S. insulin crisis. Now, insulin has been available since 1922. And the author of this small report asks, why does insulin cost 10 times as much in the United States as it does in Canada or in Europe? And two conclusions from this little editorial. 
U.S. laws allow pharmaceutical manufacturers to price their products at whatever level they believe the market will bear. That's nice. And second, direct, co uh, direct competition in the insulin market is lacking. So we might expect that at least persons with insulin-dependent diabetes that live in the northern United States would go to Canada to get their insulin. That's incidentally is exactly what they try and do. In The Lancet, the first topic involves um, how women are treated during facility-based, that means a hospital-like institution, childbirth in four countries. And uh, this report draws attention to the fact that women that are in labor uh, get are mistreated. I'm not talking about obstetrical treatment. I'm talking about how they're humanely treated. They're mistreated when they come to the hospital. Uh, they're mistreated by the nursing staff. They're mistreated by physicians. Sometimes they're even physically abused. And the abuse pattern is a function of um, whether or not they belong to a minority group and also in terms of um, uh, their social deprivation status, if I can use that term. So uh, these women are from Ghana, Guinea, Nigeria, uh, uh, Myanmar, and uh, other countries. And uh, here's a schema of how these women were collected. Uh, and we're talking about physical abuse, verbal abuse, any stigma or discrimination. And I can remember from my medical student days, I also had the impression that poor women coming to the hospital in labor uh, were verbally and not physically, but they were verbally abused. Uh, Latino women and black women uh, got a different class of treatment than other women. So if we look at this, uh, Here's the 15 minutes before, here, here's the time before and after labor. Here's verbal abuse, events per 1,000 women. This is 25% here, uh, shouted at by the staff or verbally abused or what have you, or even boxed around. This is unacceptable. Uh, but I remember this from my medical school days and it's unfortunate. The next topic is, kangaroo maternal care for infants that are born prematurely. Uh, this is also known in Germany. So I found this little report is, what is kangaroo mother care and why is it important? And this concerns breastfeeding and skin contact. Uh, even fathers, they can't breastfeed, but they can offer skin contact. And uh, this is a very serious business. So this is a, the effect of community-initiated kangaroo maternal care on the survival of infants with low birth weight, which is common, particularly in third world, what we call third world countries or uh, countries with poorer incomes. So this is a randomized study of kangaroo maternal care in these low birth weight infants. And the randomization functioned function quite well. And if we, if we look at the statistics here, uh, the kangaroo maternal care was pretty effective. And if we look at the, this is death hazard. And uh, the kangaroo kitties had a reduction of death hazard by 30%. And that was statistically significant. This was not only 28 days, but this difference got even more prominent at 180 days. So kangaroo maternal care seems to be helpful and additional statistics are given here. The next report in the Lancet involves transexamic acid. And uh, this acid inhibits the conversion of plasminogen to plasma, which is the enzyme that cleaves fibrin so that fibrin clots are dissolved. And so this is a preparation that we could give to patients that have hemorrhage or a severe risk of hemorrhage. And this strategy is not new. Uh, Transexamic acid is a 
derivative of epsilon amino coproic acid, which is, was around even when I was in medical school, a more potent agent, apertinin, was withdrawn from the market because it was so good that it was thrombogenic. But we give transexamic acid to patients that have risk of hemorrhage, uh, hypermenorrhea, hereditary angioneurotic edema. This uh, material is given to um, uh, patients uh, after uh, coronary uh, cardiac surgery, obstetrical hemorrhage, and various other reasons. And what was done in this study is these are patients that have had acute traumatic brain injury. Now, patients with epidural hematomas and subdural hematomas were excluded from the study. But these are patients that had a brain injury, traumatic brain injury, severe enough that their Glasgow coma scale was not normal. And these patients are at risk of focal cerebral hemorrhages of various sizes. And they were randomized to transexamic acid or placebo. So if we look at the deaths in these patients with severe head injuries, of course, at day one decreases through time. These are the patients that still are still alive. So we would expect this to decrease. But if we look at the patients with mild to moderate Glasgow coma scales, uh, above three, if you will, the sooner they're put on transexamic acid, the less their relatively, relative risk ratio, ratio um, of uh, head injury associated death. Now, for those that have Glasgow coma, coma scales lower than three, uh, or around three whose pupils are already dilated, uh, they don't seem to profit very much from this treatment. But otherwise, what this study shows is that patients with traumatic head, or in, head injury should probably receive tranexamic acid. The next study involves an inhaler. And uh, this is an asthma treatment trial. And basically, we're looking at a triple, uh, in, uh, three drugs administered by one inhaler compared to two drugs administered by one inhaler. And we're talking about steroids, long-acting beta stimulators, and um, uh, glycopyronium compared to a true two-drug regimen. You might imagine who will win. Now, this study involves basically two parallel running randomized controlled trials of a single inhaler triple therapy versus double therapy. And uh, the trials Trimoran versus Trigger. And what we see here basically is the triple therapy has less exacerbations. Uh, it, ha it has um, uh, FEV, FEV, FEV1 is better, uh, fewer exacerbations. Uh, then there's an additional uh, um, group in this one trial that then got the third drug, I believe is a separate inhaler, and then they show an adequate response. So if you look at these differences, they're not profound, but the triple inhaler beat the double inhaler. And um, uh, we might imagine that the three drug treatment and also the ease of using a single inhaler instead of using two inhalers uh, might be an advantage for these pa asthma patients, and indeed it was. Uh, so the single inhaler triple therapy won. Now the review in the Lancet concerns calcitonin gene-related peptide. And uh, this peptide is um, a, a, a neuropeptide uh, that um, involves uh, uh, the strongest vasodilator that's known. Uh, th that might be a great idea for cardioprotection and lowering blood pressure and perhaps even renal protection, but it would make migraine worse. And that's why the brain here is in red. And the primary uh, target here uh, that's been introduced to date is the use of an antagonist to calcitonin gene-related peptide in the treatment of migraine. And that involves um, uh, this review. There's a small molecule 
calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor antagonist, and there is also a monoclonal antibody that, target, that targets this receptor. And both of them seem to work about equally well, and that's the purpose of this review. The next review I didn't understand very well, but involves renal transplantation and the exchange of organs between first world countries and third world countries and the transfer of monies to facilitate the transfer of organs. I didn't really understand this, but basically this program matches donor and recipient pairs across high income, medium income and low income countries. I think that this review would have been helped by some sort of graphic display of exactly how this is supposed to work. Uh, but it al also involves escrow patient, uh, payments, and there's a lot of controversies about this. I don't think this is particularly relevant either. Uh, 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 don't know. I'll have to ask somebody that's into renal transplantation to explain this review to me. Now, we're almost done. Um, I wanted to introduce you to a, another article that I didn't understand very well, but this is a remarkable paper, and it was published in Nature uh, several weeks ago. And this is a clinically applicable approach to predicting the development of acute renal injury, which occurs in over 10% of all patients that are admitted to the hospital. And if they get acute renal failure, now called acute renal injury and abbreviated AKI, it's pretty much of a disaster. Uh, and it's a strong predictor of mortality while in the hospital and also later. And these authors claim that on the basis of gathering huge amounts of data and using algorithms to train their computer to deal with these data, that they can predict the patients that are going to develop acute kidney injury who are admitted to the hospital. And they claim on the basis of almost a million adult patients um, involving 172 hospitals and 1,000 outpatient sites, that they could predict half of all inpatient episodes of acute renal failure and 90% of all patients that developed acute renal failure severe enough to require dialysis. That's a remarkable claim. And basically what these investigators did is that they used all the data from an electronic medical record system available in American Veterans Administration's hospitals. These serve primarily male patients, but not exclusively. Uh, there are a lot of these hospitals. There are millions of patients that rely on these hospitals. And this study involves 700,782 adults. And AKI developed in 13% of admissions, which is not that different than those figures that are given for Europe. And um, uh, the investigators claimed that they could predict with some reliability when AKI would occur. Uh, and um, uh, they used training algorithms to train their program how these uh, patients are to be identified. If we look at this rock curve, sensitivity plotted against one minus specificity, a perfect right angle would be 100%. This is a remarkable rock curve showing remarkable precision of using a, an electronic medical record and all the information in it, and there's a lot of information in it, to predict the risk of developing acute renal failure, picking out the people that are really sick, recall sensitivity against precision for uh, setting the model at various requirements for precision. And if we look at Blue is any acute renal injury defined by um, KDGO guidelines or severe acute renal injury 
defined by the necessity of requiring dialysis and the time frame of uh, when acute renal injury occurred. Um, and it looks like dark red as detected with a 50% pre precision, that would be remarkable. And if we look at what the people really measured, found this in the methods, the data included medical records with entries up to 10 years before admission and two years afterwards when available. And it involves uh, ICD-9 scores, uh, uh, lab all the laboratory values, all the biochemistry values, hematology, cytology, toxicology, microbiology, et cetera, et cetera, uh, medications, prescriptions, orders, vital signs, health factors, and no title. Now, this kind of prediction can only be done with an electronic health record of this magnitude. There is none in Germany that even vaguely approaches these kinds of criteria to, to my knowledge. We'll close with this patient who is prescribed a medication and develops difficulty and pain, uh, while swallowing and painful swallowing. And what we see here is an example of pill-induced esophagitis. And this condition is called by, caused by physicians, resulting in odynophagia and doxycycline and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the most common culprits. And uh, here we see the CT with some contrast agent that stops here behind the heart and this awful endoscopy and this patient got better when this medication was withdrawn. Next week, I can't be here because I'm supposed to be in Moscow, uh, but in two weeks, uh, you can join me again. I'll put the file, uh, make the files available to you separately, but we'll have a combined presentation in two weeks. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Vielen Dank, Herr Bitte, bitte.